Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome to another episode of Dr. Homebrew. And we have a good one for you. We are going to be drinking a Gosa. I think, right, Brian Cooper? Yeah, Cooper? Right. Gosa. We don't have too many. I, I, keep, I feel like every show now I'm saying this. We were just talking before the, uh, before the show opened about sort of beer styles, you know, coming and going and, 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 you know, trends and what could be trending and, you know, in a joking way or whatever. But like, Goza, I feel like was something that you could have, that you saw a lot of, and then it, and you didn't. And I don't know why, because it's such a cool style. I really yeah. enjoy it. And I feel like, you know, with the sour beer trend that sort of, you know, happened and maybe plateaued a little bit, I would think that like Gozas would have lasted longer. Yeah, it got know. brought into our club. Uh, my friend Peter Munoz brought it Goza and started brewing some really good ones. And I was like, wow, that's cool. And then, like you'd see a bunch of them in competitions. And then, yeah, there's kind of, well, they're still around. You still see some. And sometimes you see fruited versions and it's kind of hung in the ether a bit. It's it's people people know it. Yeah, but yeah, it's not cool. Like, people know it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, before we get to the Goza, I want to remind you guys go over to Five Star Chemicals.com and learn everything that Five Star has for you to clean and sanitize your home brewing equipment. And this goes for your winemaking equipment, your kombucha, or your seltzer, or whatever weird shit you're doing over there at home. You got to clean it and you got to sanitize it. Those are the, the two things you got to do. While you're there, sign up for their free homebrew club program in one of the links either on the, the website there or in today's show description of the pod or on YouTube. And you can get some free product, exclusive discounts, monthly educational seminars, and free swag. So, uh, you know, there you go. They got enough swag to give to everybody. That's my, that's, that's my uh, lifestyle I want to lead or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, welcome, everybody. Today we are joined by Michelle and Melissa. Uh, who are two brewers from the Women's Craft Fermentation Alliance. Welcome, ladies. I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank hello, you. hello. Happy to have you, or happy to be here. Thanks for having us. <laughs> so, something like that. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. I mean, you're doing the work, so basically it's your show. That's what I tell everyone. It's like, you just talk about whatever you want to talk about. We'll just drink your beer. So did you two brew this beer together, or what's the story behind this beer? Uh, so this beer... I think maybe something completely different than y'all thought you were going to have, uh, uh -oh. because I what? brewed a Pivo Groditsky, um, which is a historical beer style. It's a oak smoked wheat malted beer. Um, is this it what was, we have? It was red cap. It had massive amounts of head on it. Okay. I would hope. I did forget to label them. This is what um, we have. We have a Pivo Groditsky. Okay. Are you serious? Okay. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. I'm yeah. asking because I fucking love that style. And <laughs> I, did. I wish... I had one a couple years ago on this show, opened my eyes, and I was like, everybody needs to be brewing this style of beer. I love it. Yeah. So I'm still I, uh, Yeah, I forgot the label. I think I did put in the correct uh, BJCP competition number into the little form y'all sent. Um, okay. But I, so if y'all judged it as it goes, I'm sure your score sheets are going to be very, very low. <laughs> yeah. Just take that. So maybe we now. can just riff off of uh, what the Pivo is and is not. Um, well, you know, we, when we I first do some judging on yeah. the fly, is we, we're, we're known on this show. We can adjust as we go because we're just mm. that good. I love it. I mean, that's how you do it in real life, right? Like, that's right. Crack yeah. the beer, yeah. you do your score sheet, and then you talk about it. So. Come on, Cooper. What happened? You, you, you know, you give me a Goza and then you I, set me up. You set me up. I saw I saw 27 a in the email that I got from Michelle. Okay. But, I, you know, 27 is a category. It's it's done ABC and some apps and stuff. But on the in the guidelines, it's just. 27. Oh, no. And you. But did you, uh, did you judge it as a. Oh, as yeah. A Goza? Yeah, we it did. Says, yeah, it okay. says here 27A historical beer Pivo Graditsky in the 2015. Oh well. We all make mm -hmm. errors. Mm -hmm. I'm on the, well, this would uh, be good. The app here is like can't yeah, see can't see it. All right. It's all right. It's all right. We're gonna we'll we'll tackle this beer. We'll take a break. I'm gonna come back and I want to learn a little bit about the women's craft fermentation alliance. See what you two do and uh trying to bring the world of good beer to everybody. Awesome. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Um Cooper, why don't you go ahead and uh, lead well, us off here? Just because. Since yeah, no, I need to. I need to right the wrong, I guess. Here, <laughs> um, I I was very confused when I was judging this beer. I'm like, I bet. 
<laughs> I, I, I literally, why would my, she do this? <laughs> my wife has a really good nose and a really good palate. I'm like, is this coriander or smoke? <laughs> She's like, huh? And she's just coming off a of cold too. So she couldn't figure it out for me. But yeah, I, that, uh, that was before I even tasted it. I was like, there's a campfire in the distance here. Uh, you know, where, where, where we're at. You, yeah, really nice probably. one. <laughs> yeah. So the Pivo Grodziski. Uh, Grodziski is, uh, yeah. We, we I remember that show that we had that on. It was, we had a really tasty one. It was like going down the guidelines. It's like, has that. Uh, that character that you like wow this beer works as as what it is and and it's kind of kind of an interesting style that's coming up you don't see a lot of these at all it's like the rogan beer of the you know anyway yeah it's it's uh pivo crociskia i'm trying to get the mm -hmm. pronunciation yeah they no. have a little no one here will know at least right. i won't comes from the polish city of grocisk uh anyway yeah yeah you're right oak smoked oak smoked wheat malt yeah because wow Try, trying to drink this as it goes and be like wow is she really off a rocker how are we it's gonna like, put this nice she thing? is like, the worst brewer ever <laughs> and, and you're a, a judge too right michelle yeah yeah i'm yeah, a so certified you, cicerone bgcp judge okay so you you, you should probably know what you're doing yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty sure she was messing with us, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be a hoot? She's like, hey, let's just <laughs> mess with these beer judge guys. Let's see how well they get it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't okay. know, man. We're just we're just three drunks that we met in an alley somewhere. Like, let's try to get free beer from people. So yeah, um, the first thing that hits you in this beer and the nose, uh, well, first when I opened it had a nice uh medium hiss and uh you know, good, good cap and fill and everything. Um, and when I was tasting for it goes, I was like, I'm digging for any like sourness, but it's like, I'm just getting hit by that, this nice, really wonderful smelling smoke up front. And it's, uh, you know, like a distant campfire, you know, kind of subtle smoke malt character just coming across. Um, maybe a little bit of a spicy uh, hop underneath there. Um, as far as the fermentation character, it's got some, a little bit of kind of apple pear esters. It's, it's, you know, it's, it seems very clean and, um, yeah, looking for any, any, uh, uh, <laughs> going back to the coast style. It's like, where, where is that, uh, the coriander? Uh, it's just not there. Um, uh, so <laughs> we'll just, we'll, we'll go back into pivo mode here um so yeah it's got this kind of distant campfire like really nice low bread bready like malt character underneath um the hops are really really low shouldn't be a hoppy style but clean no dms no diacetyl uh yeah pleasant light fruitiness alongside that um in the appearance is a nice light yellow straw color uh moderate haze and a fluffy white everlasting head that just clings to the sides of the glass and just lasts all the way through really nice appearance and appropriate for this style as well as it would it would work for the other style too you know so in that respect it was it was fine appearance wise for for goes um in the flavor so it's got a, a really light um delicate maltiness almost when you get a, a smoked hellas but like with a little more um rich smoke character to it than you get in in those like the the schlenkerla i love the the schlenkerla smoked hellas but it comes across yeah. the, that kind of way in that the 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 smoked malt is not overpowering the the malt you still get a really nice um you know light bready doughy malt in there um that that works with the uh, the smoked uh, quality of the malt in there as well. Um, you know, a little bit of a little bit of ester to it, not too much. It's a, seems like a well um, well brewed uh, kind of a light ale, and 
Yeah, the smoke is not biting or ashy. It's just really smooth. Um, I think that it's got a fairly kind of medium bitterness to it. It's not super um, over the top on the bitterness front. Um, some of them can be more bitter than this. And I think some of that bitterness does come from the, the smoke, which is, it's a phenolic and it can give the impression of some, some heart, some roughness to it, some bitterness, but um, the finish is, is clean and dry. Um, in the aftertaste, you just get this light, uh, light smokiness in there trailing off and it, it hangs on, but it doesn't like choke you with ash. It's, it's really delicate. <laughs> for such a you know flavorful <laughs> intense beer i don't drink a lot of smoked beers but i could definitely drink a lot of this because it's like the smoked hellas i could drink a fair amount of that i could have two pints of that probably and you know this maybe even three and then i'd switch back to ipas and stuff but yeah I'm well that's weird. where you would lose me uh, i'm weird like I would that. get up and leave yeah i like those weird esoteric beers you know uh it's like ipas yeah, yeah, these yeah. you know these commonplace beers like yeah, the, you're so dark and moody. It's risky. It's just yeah. everybody has these everywhere nowadays. You know, sure, of course. Um, mouthfeel wise, the beer feels really smooth and it's actually somewhat quenching. Um, it's got that really pleasantly perky high uh, carbon, you know, carbonation to it. Um, the body of the beer is kind of medium. It's not really uh, creamy or astringent at all. And then you get a little, little, uh, you know, a, a little bit of an attack on the tongue from the, the smoked malt, but it's not harsh or biting at all. Um, and it just dries off your tongue, really. The, the dryness is nice. Um, so, yeah, this is a very good example. As I, as I was drinking the goes, I'm like, this is like, it, it, it's, it, it seems like a, it's, it's, it's it's not a goes it's it's a i was i was like figured that were they, what were they going for was it a yeah, a, yeah like I, and i kept trying to talk myself into you know a little tartness a little sourness but it just wasn't really you know for it goes it was just under sour and you know i appreciate that you were trying to convince yourself i was like, trying I appreciate that yeah it's almost like uh too kind you're too kind to be a judge i am too kind yeah um yeah, I was just like, my advice would be like, stay away from campfires when you're trying to brew your, uh, <laughs> your goes. Um, yeah. Those are, Get head. Yeah. Don't um, brew during fire season. Just mm. don't, yeah, don't even go there. All right, well, judging on the fly, adjusting on the fly, what would you, uh, what would you give it? I would say probably 39. This is a really solid um, Pivo Gortziski. I think it's a, it's right in the territory for all the, the characters that you want. Encourage everybody to download the guidelines or go on uh, bgcp.org and look at the guidelines for this beer. It's a really interesting style that developed in yeah. in Poland, and um, it's not something you get every day. So No, um, no you basically have well, to brew it if you want it. Well-made example like this. Or go to Poland. You find well, some there, I'm sure. Right? You can take the walk to Poland. You know what I mean? Mm. Right. <laughs> But yeah, no. It's just based on the 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 actual smoke character of it. It's it's perfect for the style as I know it. And again, it's a style that I've had a handful of times at most, and all home brewed. So um, I would look forward to trying a commercial version of this sometime when uh, when I can find one. But um, it hits all the marks and a very solid beer. Thank you for sharing it. Yeah. Sorry absolutely. for the sorry for the mishap. Don't worry about it. <laughs> You're fine. I mean, you're, I'm assuming you're apologizing to me. Yes, JP, to you. <laughs> all your, you have to re, re-edit the whole first part of the show. And No, I'm leaving it in, man. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're leaving it in. Uh, let's take a quick break. We're going to come right back, and we'll get into Brian Shard's uh, interpretation of the beer, and uh, we'll learn about the recipe and a little bit more about the, uh, the beer and stuff like that. So hang on, everyone. It's Dr. Homebrew. We'll be right back. All right. Thanks for sticking around, everyone. We are ready for Brian Shard. Mr. Shar, I'm assuming you're uh, you're ready for this transition, and uh, he's recalibrated. Do, 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 yeah. do, do, do. I, <laughs> I I am the ready. Ticker tape is and coming you know, out of his mouth. <laughs> bat, bat. Yeah, it's so funny that 
Tate, we always talk about on the show how taste and smell are so suggestible and so malleable. Mm-hmm. And what you what someone tells you, you can talk yourself into tasting it. And if you hear something, you're you're prepped for it. And when I was drinking this, thinking it was a goza, I'm like, ooh, I ooh, what do I say about this? I don't want to, I don't want to be too hard on this. This is so weird and muddled and not a goza. And <laughs> I started talking myself into there's no salt. Then wait a second, there's a lot of salt, there's way too much salt. <laughs> there's no there's no salt in here at all. I thought I, there's got to be there's something so weird about this. Uh, and I think it was high per- sodium just by well, exactly just looking at it. I, my sodium's way up, but <laughs> I I think it was the smoke that I was perceiving maybe as. But you, you, your brain can talk yourself into something, and I didn't like it that much because I'm like, oh, I, I it's supposed to be a goza and it's not it. And then you said it's a, a Grodziski. I'm like, oh hell yeah. This is this is good. And it's yeah. the same is the same beverage. It's the same fluid in this glass, but it's your expectations of what it's supposed to be that that really influence how you perceive it. And there might be a life lesson in there in general. I I, I don't know, but uh, maybe even more so than the glass half empty or half full. But, you know, you're when you're primed to expect a thing, doesn't matter how good the thing that you get is, if it's different, you're going to be like, ah, that's 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 wrong. That's that's not good. But yeah, it took about uh, 30 seconds to kind of get my head right on this. This is a really, <laughs> a really fantastic beer. And it's a style that, man, I wish that, you know, wish people made it commercially and I wish it was available commercially. Uh, and this may be a good reason for me to maybe start brewing again someday, <laughs> but <laughs> start, start to have some of this good stuff. Maybe. Uh, so I, I really like this beer. Uh, there's a, a hiss on opening, which is always a good sign. Uh, aroma. I got kind of an earthy aroma at first. Well, of course, uh, there's some uh, some smoke, some barrel. Uh, there's some oak in here. Uh, there's definitely, uh, as I said, no coriander, no fruit, you know, no no salt, uh, no off aromas. Uh, it really does. The the smoke in this this style is so wonderful. So I, I like I like Rauch beer. I know in general people don't like it, but this has just this style has just the right amount and this beer has just the right amount uh, to be, be pleasant and not off putting and to really blend in with everything else. Could you call uh, it a, like a gateway to Rauch beer? Like this is something, an entry level Rauch beer. Like you don't like, like Rauch beer. Well, try this. Yes. If you don't want don't to know. get a Schlenker law and drink one that t- is going to taste like a summer sausage and then drink a second one and then really get what it is. This is a good gateway to that. Yes. Or drink one of these and then try a Schlenker Law. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I, it's very, the smoke on these are very ag- aggressive. And I don't think the Schlenker Law is as like a bright smokiness. It's more of like a malty smokiness, if that makes any sense. Yeah. It's sort of layered in, but the sweetness of the of the, of the the malt, it for me, I think a Schlenker Law would be more approachable. Now, if you're like a, really? a hop okay. head or an IPA drinker, maybe then this would be, because it, it's almost borderlines that, because there is a, a hop, I don't want to say aggressiveness, but for me, well, I think I taste a little bit of hop. So I, I don't know. Maybe if you're used to the, like aggressive, then this would be fine. This could be a, maybe. It, well, the oak smoked malt is actually supposed to be less intense and less, but it's a different smoke character than the, the beechwood smoked malts yeah. in, in right. Bamberg. So, uh, but I'll, we'll yeah, just let totally Brian different. finish his and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the style too. Oh. Yeah. Well, it, I just exactly. Like but I mean, it's like the oak smoke. It's like anything else, right? You might be more sensitive to oak smoke than to beechwood smoke, and s- some people might be vice vice versa. I mean, to me, like a Schlenker law is a really almost meaty type of smoke. It, it makes me think of a summer sausage or some bacon or some kind of does. meat. And you uh, said vice versa, and I, I instantly thought like that's a na- you're talking about um, like Hefeweizen right now. Why are, you, <laughs> why are you naming beers? I don't understand. Vice yeah, I, I'm, I'm just coming up. I'm, I'm dropping gold right here, man. I'm yeah, coming something. up with styles right and left here. Uh, but you know, this, this to me is it's a little more, uh, you know, there's definitely smoke, but it's maybe a, a higher note, maybe a brighter smoke than some of the, like a Schlenker law or some of the more traditional Rauk beers. But uh, anyway, uh, nine out of 12 for aroma appearance. There's a medium haze, which is fine. I mean, it's barely hazy, but that's totally fine for the style. Uh, pale straw color, uh, medium persistent head, which, I mean, it was medium. Now it's just very persistent. It's not, m- not much, but it's there and it sticks around. 
uh, three out of three. Uh, flavor uh, starts off with kind of a medium bready flavor uh, and nor, no salt, no sourness. Yep, that I still I maintain my uh, previous comments on that. Uh, you get definitely a, a a smoky and oaky character that is. I, I think it, it's it's got to be so hard to do this in a beer that's this light. You know, people think of a, a wood aged beer or something, and it's always like, oh, an imperial stout or something. You know, huge. This it just really goes well with this. Uh, the uh, mid palate, there's sort of some low bitterness, and this this is not a hop oriented beer. You know, I, I don't get really any hop flavor in this, but you know, I don't think this is a style you really want a lot of hop flavor in. There's bitterness to balance. Uh, you know, the finish is long and it's a well attenuated sample. It's a very balanced, uh, uh, long finish in this where you get the oak, you get the smoke, you get a little, little bit of the malt. So you get this 14 out of 20 for flavor. Uh, mouthfeel, four out of five. Uh, I knocked it down a point because carbonation is kind of medium, maybe a little bit lower than would be expected. That's maybe a commonality. Maybe the one commonality between Goza and uh, Grodziski is there should be like high carbonation beers. But it's you know, we talked about that in the last segment in the previous show. It's just really hard at a homebrew level. You know, whether, whether you're filling from a keg or whatever you're doing, it's hard to get carbonation right a lot of the time. Uh and it's still it, it's it's one point out of you know fifty total. Uh, it's medium body, more creamy than astringent, no warming. Again, four out of five. Overall impression, I gave an eight for a total of thirty eight, which is excellent. I think this really is an excellent excellent beer. Uh, I really like this. It's well made. It's something that you don't get every day or see every day, or most people even know about. Uh, the only thing I would change in this is. Uh, maybe up the carbonation some, but otherwise this is, I think really flavorful and really good. I got a fair amount of spritz in the mouthfeel still that my, I just want to argue with you on the, the, the spritziness of it yeah. and the head keeps pushing up. We'll let JP be the tiebreaker on that aspect, but. Um, I yeah. I mean, I've, you know, I'm, I keep filling my glass. Uh, this is a bad glass for, but uh, there's, I think there's a fair amount of head. Uh, I'm not concerned about it. But it, it on just it does have a little prickle on the tongue in the mouthfeel, and it does it does push a lot of flavor out. That if it was anywhere near flat, it wouldn't do the same. It wouldn't have the same effect. Yeah, and yeah. That's you know, the... in fairness, in fairness, Brian, my to, to Michelle and to Melissa, my bottle that I I just re-poured from has been sitting open for two and a half hours. Well, there you so go. So that oh, probably okay. has a little bit to do with it. Uh, but I did make a note that my carbonation was maybe a little bit lower than I wanted, even when I poured it. So it could be bottle variation. Okay. But again, that's yeah. to me, that's like a one point factor uh, just for that. Uh, and if I reopen this from scratch and then knew what it was, I might end up be, being. Yeah, I, I could easily see this being over 40. No, yeah, it's it's yeah. definitely the sitting open because and when mine, my first sample, the head just lasted forever and it was just thick for oh, like days on it for sure. And uh, and now it's a little bit less, but it's still there and there's still plenty of carbonation in there. But it was a little bit more earlier. Uh, and I think it got colder as because I put it back in the fridge and it's a little colder now mm. than when I judged it earlier. But um, All right. yeah, well, that's at least good. now it makes sense to me. It's the right beer. <laughs> yeah, You're, you can go to sleep at tonight because I know uh, you. You're gonna be laying awake going. It, I think she said, <laughs> I don't. But now uh, we have closure for 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 Brian, and I appreciate that. Well, Michelle. We, yeah. Yes. Tell us about this beer, please. Well, you know, I uh, came across this beer style when I started working at F.H. Steinbart, which oh. is the homebrew company here in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And yeah, it's a great place. And uh, one of my cohorts that worked there was a big, huge Graditsky lover. Uh, he loved to brew it. And he trumpeted it far and wide from the top of the uh, <laughs> mountaintop to encourage everyone to make this, yeah. um, especially since of the ease of it. It's seven pounds of oak smoked wheat malt, a pound of rice hulls, a 20 minute edition of whatever German hop you want, and you're done. Um, and it really is that easy. And this beer is about a 3.4%. Started off at 1032, got down to about 1006. Um, so I just love how flavorful it is for being such a low ABV sessional beer. It doesn't have that thinness. 
um, mm-hmm. that a lot of those lower ABVs can get, you know. Um, and in terms of the smoke character, you know, for me, I always tell people it's like when you put a sweatshirt on that you sat around the campfire at about three days later, and you're kind of <laughs> like, there's something is like, I smell a little something. What's going on? Oh, yeah, right. Um, I find that I drink this so often, I always have a keg of it. I pretty much hardly taste the smoke at all anymore. Um, you know, your palate actually acclimatizes to smoke quite a bit, you know. I'm, I believe um, I'm seeing that when I'm as I'm drinking it. Like at first taste, I was like, wow, that is a great and I like a smoke beer. And I've brewed this a couple of times. I I think I I got a five gallon batch. I think it had like six pounds because I'm like yeah, I'm a little baby sometimes. Yeah. But um, but it's like, wow, it's so aggressive. And then now I'm drinking, I'm like, I think it's there. Like, <laughs> I mean, not really, but you know what I mean? It is it is definitely toned down and acclimatized. Um Someone told me years yeah. ago, Ralph Olson from um, Hop Union, he was like, he was the one who told me, your mouth has a pH and it needs to adjust to the beer. You, you know, you need to balance that out before you even hope to start tasting anything in a beer. Oh, that's, that's very cool. Happening. Yeah, oh, I like I that. Know. Yeah, usually I just throw in a 20 minute of Ted Nanger or maybe Holler Tau. Um, yeah. A lot of times I use Saz, just kind of what I have on hand. Uh, this time around, I was a little low on my nobles, um, so I kind of, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, it was mostly still Hollertau and, and Saz, but mm-hmm. a little bit of nobility in there, which is not a hop that a lot of people have a lot of experience with. Just got a little bit of citrusy, which I thought works, because sometimes for me, that wheat character comes across with a little bit of lemony, um, a little bit of tang to it, you know, and I think I- that works. I was thinking um, that there was a citrus, like a lemon yeah, thing to it. Yeah. I didn't want to say it, but now I should have. So, I'm going to go yeah. back in time. I'm going to insert me saying that in, in, the, uh, in the edit. Uh, yeah, so, I, I found cool. once I became a home brewer how much I love wheat beers. I had yeah. no idea um, until I started brewing with it. And I was just like, I love this stuff. Um, so I've done quite a few 100% oak beers um, outside mm. of just the Grotzer. Um but yeah, a few things I didn't do on this beer that I normally always do is I normally always clarify it with uh, gelatin or eyes and glass mm-hmm. because when it's really crystal clear, it is just beautiful. And I usually bottle condition as well because this style does call for bottle conditioning and the guidelines. And I am one of those folks that if a beer should be bottle conditioned, I bottle condition it. Otherwise, I will keg it, you know? Yeah, right. yeah kind of, you know, okay. I... I haven't I quite that. decided if there is that true difference in quality of carbonation between natural and forced, but I feel like there is something to that. Um, I think it could be my own perception of it, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it could be either just like you want to justify the hard work sure. you're doing. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I, I, and I think on a homebrew level, it, you know, I think there's maybe a little flavor, tiny bit of flavor, but I think it's hard to measure because carbonating yeah. as a home brewer is just sort of inherently hit or miss. I find it much easier to dial in carbonation when I'm bottle conditioning. Really? Um, okay. Yeah. So this guy, I will definitely pump up to like three and a half volumes. Usually when I bottle condition, mm-hmm. um, I actually over carbonated the keg a little bit. Um, so I tried to kind of, I took it off gas and tried to let it kind of resettle a little bit. Um, and then of course in the packaging, you know, we, we, from bottle from keg to bottle you always lose some Mm -hmm. um and that's certainly i i poured one here before i came on from my draft and you know the head was a third (laughs) of the glass you know um so it definitely can get that that much higher carbonation but yeah it's i think it's a great beer i love it and you know what if you all want to have some commercial examples come on up to portland because we have a place up here called threshold brewing Mm-hmm. head brewer name of Yarek. He is Polish. He's done a version oh, of this wow. and a bunch of other breweries are like, Hey, that's cool. And now they've come out with it too. A uh, Von Ebert brewing had one. Um, I've had one from steeplejack brewing. Uh, one of the head brewers there, her grandmother was Polish and she remembers this beer from when she was a child and Jeez. brew it, brews it in her honor. So it's almost always on tap at steeplejack. Man, that, um, so that's the kind yeah. of story. Those are the cool stories. I, I, I don't want to say we miss anymore, but you know, when, when craft beer was sort of coming up in the, you know, mid late nineties or whatever, it was, it was a story. That's what we were pushing a lot. And then now it's what's on Instagram. And I think we sort of lose that connection yeah. between 
uh, you know, the brewer and and the pat if they even had a connection to beer. Maybe the you know not everybody needs to have a story, I guess. But uh, I like hearing stuff like that. It's neat. Agreed. And great. you know, I yeah. think Portland does support the small guys. You know, it's kind of what we do up here. Yeah. Um, yeah. and we have a very vibrant nano brewery scene. Um, really? and then you know, smaller breweries. And yeah, we have a whole okay. nano fest twice a year. Um, it's fantastic. Wow. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. Nano beer fest. I yeah, I've been to Portland like five years and uh, I miss it. Yeah, I, it's uh, Portland's rad. It's a great people, city. Yeah, Come on there's up, people man, uh, feeding off of each other's energy and that. And one thing about like during the pandemic that I kind of actually enjoyed was the a lot of the brewer collabs were fantastic because people would just get mm -hmm. together and brew because. They had all this time and that's, you know, that was their business. It's like, let's get together and do collab brews. And there were just tons of them that came out and you'd pull them home and sip in place. And you, well, know. you say during, like, like it's over. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm always going to give you shit about that. No matter what, I'm always going to be, I'm, I'm your mom. You remember that pandemic that we had two years ago, mm -hmm. JP? Yeah. Um, it we're was during in. that time. Yeah. We're still in right now. Yeah. Okay. Just so, J so JP, I gotta, I gotta let you, you're gonna, you're gonna be hating living here and not in Portland when I sh tell you this. Mm -hmm. The Steeplejack Place has a English dark mild ale. Oh, yeah. on, oh, on cask. Oh. On cask. Yeah. It's right delicious. Now. They have it all the time. It's one of their core oh, beers. Yeah. God. It's, yeah, and <laughs> it's, we and it's in, the... in an old refurbished. We yeah. went, Melissa, when you came up, it's in an yeah. old refurbished yeah. church. Mm -hmm. And the brewery sits in the brew system sits right there on the floor oh, man. with a stained glass window right behind it. Um, See, all female, I'll... all female brew crew there as well. That's cool. Yeah. And they said about 3 p.m. Just... The light comes through and just oh, like God. kind of. Makes the brewery all beatific and you know amazing. Yeah, all we do here but is throw so hops cool. and shit. It's just like <laughs> cool. I mean, great. Yeah, we've awesome. been there, done that. You know, it. I yeah. think that uh, it's kind of cool. I think that craft beer brewers, you know, we've come full circle almost, and we're starting to revisit those English styles right now. Um, I'm starting to see some bitters, and there's definitely a lot of dark milds happening up here. Wow! And I am all I am here for it. 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. I was talking to uh, Jim a couple of years ago, talking to Jamil when he owned uh, when he uh, owned um, Heretic, and uh, you know he goes, I I do an ESB to as a starter for my other large beers, but I end up throwing out most of it because nobody buys it. I'm the only one who drinks it. So like, I'll go up and I get, I just get like a keg, like a, like a seven, seven, five or whatever every once in a while, not anymore, obviously. But you know, he's like, it doesn't need to be an ESB, but I like it. I like drinking it. So I need to make it. So I'm going to make it. And I drew, I brew what I drink and I throw it away because nobody buys it. Oh man. That's he's so, so mad. Wow. Yeah, I know. Wow. Mm -hmm. But well, you know, you know we uh, it was just fresh hop season here recently yeah. um and of course portland goes absolutely wild with the fresh hop beers and the coolest thing is it's not just pale ales and ipas my favorite beer of hop season fresh hop season is usually from barrelic it's a fresh mm. hopped esb and oh, it wow. is so good well that does sound really amazing i'm not always a huge fan of the fresh hop beers but that's like one where you could use the fresh hops and not have to pile in, you know, 10 pounds per gallon or something uh, where you're really getting all that vegetal. You're yeah, probably yeah. you're getting just enough fresh hop where you're getting that character without it being all green and you're eating the hop vine type of flavor. Yeah, yeah. but I, I, I and I haven't had a fresh hop beer in a few years now for no reason. Yeah. No, me either. Uh, I mean, well, because I, it, there is a reason I haven't been out. But uh, <laughs> before then, they were sort of hard to find. I think in the Bay Area, they sort of fell out of favor. They were harder to find, um, but yeah, they were. I think I'm. I'm hoping people know how to use the ingredient now, because yeah, it was like chewing on the vine, where it's just like, it just smells like wood, and this is weird yeah. because you want to cram it all in. But that was the the mindset back then. Let's see what we could do. Let's see how many, you know, things we could do or whatever. Yeah, and Portland is you know two and a half hours from the fields in a lot right. of way, you know, in a lot of directions. So they literally are picking them, bringing them and throwing them straight into the mash tun or, you know, into the boil kettle or, you know, into the dry hop um, as fresh as can be. And yeah, it's, it's real fun. Yeah. yeah. It sounds cool. I, uh, I, yeah, I love them. Let's take a quick break. We're going to come back. 
Um, if we have anything left over, any low hanging fruit from the beer, you know, we can talk about that. If not, uh, you know, we can move on, but I do want to learn a little bit more about the, the women's craft fermentation Alliance and what you two are doing in the industry to support, uh, women and uh, non, non-binary folks and, uh, you know, make, uh, make everything a little more inclusive. So uh, hang on everyone. It's Dr. Homebrew. We'll be right back. All right, thanks for sticking around, everybody. We are here with Michelle and Melissa. They are from the Women's Craft Fermentation Alliance. And uh, not only are they sharing uh, some good conversation, but some good beer, too, as well. So, again, uh, welcome to the show, ladies. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So, Melissa, talk to me a little bit about uh, about the WCFA. You were the the, uh, founder of the Women's International Beer Summit. Yes, I am. Yes. what, uh, What is that? Oh, Women's Craft Fermentation Alliance. That is a 501c3 that we created once we um, got started with our uh, women's. Um... <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm nervous. I oh, don't be. That's all right. <laughs> You're doing great. Yeah. With our beer summit that we've created, we uh, decided once we got that going that we wanted to be our own 501c3 so we could get some other initiatives started. Um, as a nonprofit, and so we could get sponsorships for that, and so that's what we've gotten going now. So, nice. actually, all came together about uh, the fall of 2020 mm. at the height of the the pandemic. How about we say yeah. it like that? At the <laughs> See, <pandemic>. Yes, <laughs> yes. And the the fall of of 2020 is is apropos, yes. anyways, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and we just there was nothing we could do to meet together, and I was in charge of the Queen of Beer, which is the oldest yeah. uh, female competition in the United States. With very was the honor to be the director for that for a couple of years, and uh, got together with uh, I, I'm not sure if you've ever heard this term before. The onomi, it's a it's a Japanese uh, online drinking thing that people get together in Japan. It's called onomi. What? And so I started uh, those up with a couple of friends. And so oh, during man. one of those on no me's, I was talking to some friends and saying, you know, it's like we can't hold the competition anymore or we couldn't do it with any assurance that it was actually going to happen because it was like things were in, things were out. You could you could meet, you could not. And so it's like, what, what are we going to do? Everybody's out there making all this wonderful beer and um, nobody can do anything with it and there's no connection anymore. And how do we put that together? Mm-hmm. So we just started collaborating together and we came up with this idea to do an online seminar, a virtual seminar, and it kind of grew from kind of a small idea into this international beer summit. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm on the website for it and it's massive. Like I can't it's, believe it's, the amount of information that you have. Well, uh, you at can this thank event. Michelle Wonder for that. She's our, our webmaster and she's amazing, as you can see, as a brewer and as a webmaster. <laughs> so yeah. she's no, I love the coming. website because you can get mm-hmm. into, you know, you can go through the um, the beer summit from last year. And I think you leave the information up for a year, I believe I saw. Uh, um, it's going to go bigger than that because okay. Mich- uh, Michelle's idea to start a podcast with all of the information. And so now that's yes. all out there. And then we also have the YouTube channel where we're um, sharing all of the information too, because we want to make it all available for everyone. Yeah, I like that. Uh, but the website's cool because you you go through the uh, the session and it's by interest and it's sorted really nice. Uh, mm-hmm. But you can click on the session and then you can click on the the profile. Yes. Of the people who are giving the session, and so you, yes. you get you get a lot of information just by looking at the website. Mm-hmm. It's great. Mm-hmm. I wish every uh, session would do that. Every seminar would do something like this. Just give me more in depth about the person. Yes. Yeah, yes. I like that. Mm-hmm. And we could teach you a lot about how not to do a podcast. So I'm sure you'll do that better than us too. So uh, we'll just yeah. let you figure that out on your own and uh, we'll carry on. doing. Yeah. First of all, it. know what you're drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Roasted. <laughs> Got him. Okay. So the, uh, the women's international beer summit, mm-hmm. that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. So that was, when was that? The first one was April of 2021. Okay. And so that was, it was unbelievable. We couldn't believe the response that we got or the the quality of speakers that we were able to obtain for it. I can't even remember now. I think we had like 35 uh, different sessions with um, like, wow. there was like 50 or 60 different speakers and just 
it was such an honor to be able to speak to all of these people and how willing they were to give their time to us. Yeah. I and mean, you know, we had the the curator for the Smithsonian was one of our first speakers to talk oh. about what she's doing. And wow. what I like to do with all of the speakers is, is like I ask them because the idea is to educate not only educate, but also to inspire people and encourage them to reach for what are your goals in the beer industry and why aren't you looking after them and why aren't you going after them? And so I ask each of the speakers, it's like, who are you? What do you do? Why are you doing it? How did you get where you are? And also what's next for you. And if you could talk to your younger self, what would you, what would you say to do differently? And so they're kind of covering all of that. And the goal is for even the, the home brewer and the home enthusiast is to look at, it's like, if you want to be part of the industry, you don't just, it's not just a brewing career. I mean, there's a ton of different things you can be doing within the industry. And I want people to see all of that and see where they fit and, and, you know, live your, live your dream and live also what you're best at. So, you know, figure out what your gifts are and use them. So, yeah. Uh, last year, yeah, you had our very own Teresa Pasuti. We did. Oh, yeah. Yes. She's, yes. she's crazy. She'll get you, <laughs> man. She is smart. And you had, of course, Annie Johnson. Yes. Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of people. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. I mean, that, that basically rivals like a homebrew con as far as, as scope. I mean, that's, it really does. Yeah. I honestly, mean, um, I, I mean, no offense to them. Right. But like, yeah. you know, a, a lot of sessions I'll see that pop up here and there are very targeted, very mm -hmm. focused, you know, but you seem to sort of run the gamut between home brewing and professional and everybody in between. That's it really sort of are. speaks to your, yeah, your mission of just inclusivity and yeah, bringing everybody on board. Mm-hmm. And we had it. folks from Norway. We had Linda Van Loon with Eakin Teed out of Norway who does raw beer. Wow. Um, we raw had beer. raw, raw beer. beer. Uh -huh. Raw beer, so non-boil. Okay. Non-boil right. and mixed firms. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. I don't Super know how unique. to feel about that. Yeah, it makes me itchy. Very unique. Okay. Um, I like the tact that she kind of talked about how uh, environmentally friendly it is too. It's like saving so much on not having to power your kettles and use I extra guess, water and all right? this kind of stuff. The carbon monoxide kind of cool. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. But also just really unique. And they blew up during COVID. Um, they were shut down obviously. And they started doing their, you know, bottle to go program. And all of a sudden like, boom, they just blew up. Um, but we spoke with, you know, a brewer in South Africa. We spoke with a group of home brewers, female home brewers out of um, Argentina that are really breaking through a very male dominated and chauvinistic society to kind of make noise out there, sure. which is awesome. Um, and Argentina. You know, course, <laughs> and Australia, right. you know, England. Yeah. Um you know, we truly had international speakers and that's what we love about it being the digital format. You know, it's an online, we had it hosted on Crowdcast the last couple of years. Uh, we're looking for a new host this year. Um, and a lot of people have said, are you going to do live? Are you going to do live? And it's like, well, you know, we want to do some live, but we do definitely do not want to take away this digital aspect of it because right. it makes it so accessible for so many people. Not many people can spend $400 for a homebrew ticket. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, and four days off of travel. And especially mm -hmm. when you put women in that mix, they're generally the ones that have more responsibility for the family and the home and yeah. the children. And, you know, um, so they can easily pick up and watch a couple hours here and there and then catch the repeats after the fact. Listen to the, uh, you know, listen to the podcast, check out a session on YouTube. You know, we just want as many people as possible to to be able to see and gain this information from all these amazing women who very often are asked on things to talk about being a woman rather than what they do and presenting their special skill and knowledge base. Um, and the first year, so many of the speakers were like, it's so refreshing to be asked to come on and talk to what I do best and what I love mm -hmm. and not be asked, yeah. what's it like to be a woman in the beer industry? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. On, on the one hand, I, I, I respect that. On the other hand, I guess I, I'm coming from the other side of that where it's, which I've never, <laughs> you know, have done. We've had like Annie Johnson on and talked about just what she does. Like you said, uh, when she was with Pico brew and we never really oh, yeah. got into the, the gender roles within the industry, but just to sort of address them that they are there. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is also, I don't know. I still want to know. 
right. still, still, yeah. still that, that, that little that little question yeah. where it's like, you know, I know it's a little uncouth to ask, but because it's hard because that's what we're that's what we're, you know, for better, or for worse, we're, we're for better. Or worse. It took this long. Right. For us to right. sort of realize that. Mm hmm. And so now we're making we're making there's yes. effort out there to change. Yes, I I, yeah. I want to know. Not this is going to sound stupid, but I want to know why. You know what I mean? Like because it's not, it's not um, as as a as a guy in the beer industry, quote unquote. You sort of just walk around. You think everything's fine. Right. Like why is my my homebrew club? You know, ninety five percent. Got no, white guys, you know, or you whatever. Don't think about it. Mm -hmm. You don't. And, I, I've never thought about it, and and I, so as you hear more stories come out, you're like, "Wow, that, wow, okay." I would like, yeah, I, what, I get it. One of my this sucks. <laughs> yeah, one yeah. of my biggest questions would be like, um, how would would you speak to a homebrew club that wants to encourage more uh, female involvement or or any organization for that matter, like? you know, what are some good strategies that you can use to make yourself as welcoming as possible and embrace, you know, these talented people that are out there and, and get them to feel welcome coming in and, and, and just be, you know, a part of the solution, get making more equality out there, basically. Sure. Sure. What, Melissa, what would, you would you like to encourage? <laughs> well, I, I've been thinking about that for my own homebrew club too. We have about four women in ours and i think it is just to be very welcoming and to to make sure that everyone is on board with that mm -hmm. you know mm, okay. that's it's, not always for me case. it's yeah for I me see, it's the visibility of it i, I want to see i want to see a woman <laughs> yeah i want to see a woman that sits on the board i want to see a yeah. female president i want to see female representation on the website when you put up pictures on your social media, I want to see women in there. You know, and, I want to see a diversity of folks. That matters. Um, that, like, it matters. As, it does. As someone, again, as someone who's on the other side of that, it's like, oh, you tell me that it matters and I believe you. I'm not going to say like, oh, it shouldn't matter or whatever, right? All that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's interesting how just that little bit of outreach or that little bit of effort to show the diversity of your group can impact people. I mean, I have a Disney Absolutely. podcast. I'm like a Disney guy. And um, I just saw um, in uh, Small World, a couple of the dolls in Small World now are in wheelchairs. Mm. And there one of go. my co-hosts who has another job, he's like, I showed this to, to my friend's mom or something like that, who has been in a wheelchair for like 15 years. She cried mm. because she's like, I, you know, not to, I feel seen, right? Not to be too, yeah, know, whatever, but, mm -hmm. but, and I, right. I would have never imagine that that sort of reaction could happen now i'm obviously not equating the disability with making beer at home and a group uh, feeling safe right. in a group of people but i imagine that's part of it too to come into to a group that's welcoming melissa like you were saying and just to feel safe i don't and know that's the thing is you can be my... welcoming when they walk through the door but how do you get them to walk through the door right right, right. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, I put a sign up that says everyone welcome. And so if they don't come in, that's their problem. Yeah. That is not yeah. how it works. We didn't want <laughs> it. No, all. it's not, not going to work. But, yeah. Like, yeah. I think like the the learn to homebrew that we just did. And and if you, I like that uh, the way that we did it is we collaborated with a local homebrew shop. And so it was open to everyone to show up. And then we made sure that we had women and men there you know mm -hmm. to greet people as they came in and we actually got a mix of people that were new to home brewing and they wanted to know what was going on and so that was really nice and so yeah i think you know you need the you need to have the the women there as well so it's like brian bring your wife you know bring your wives have them show yeah. up the learn, the learn to home brews so they can see ah there's women here too you know yeah and jason i see your point too because i can see with with what you're asking is is like you are a welcoming person mm -hmm. and so you don't understand what the problem is because you're like oh cool there's a woman here all right we're gonna brew this is awesome where yeah. there's other people not so much so, yeah right yeah. yeah you know it's it's funny there's there's uh you know as a middle-aged white dude you know I, I kind of echo mostly what a lot of what jason says but I, I was at a conference recently and there was like a breakfast uh for like like women in ip law and i thought about going and i'm like I don't know if I'm supposed to go. I'm not sure if I'd be, well, is this just for 
women? Is this okay for me to be there? Mm. And it's got to be just the flip side, right? Because especially in home brewing, where you have so many people that come into the hobby who are dudes who are engineers. And, <laughs> enge- and enge- well, engineer, and, and there's nothing wrong with being a dude who's an engineer, but oh. engineering already is a super white man field. Mm. And then you'd start drawing from that. You're going to naturally have just tons of white dudes and you don't think about it when you're inside the barrel, like Jason was saying, it's when it, it's, and that's the importance of representation. Again, I'm just, I'm just echoing stuff we've already talked about that to know that you're okay to go somewhere kind of means you have to see someone like you that's going somewhere. Right. Otherwise right. it's real scary to go do something. Mm. You know, it's like going to an unfamiliar right. neighborhood or a different city even, or something. Right. I, I don't know. Will I be welcome there? Am I going to have yeah. trouble? What's yeah. So that that's that's an issue that is a uh, I think it's an important issue to deal with. And it's, uh, you know, uh, it also like in any hobby. So I'm just going to blah, blah, blah for a little bit longer. I, I <laughs> well, think like you're a lawyer, any, of course. Exactly. I think it, in any, any any hobby or any, any well, yeah, exactly. Any any volunteer type nonprofit organization or group, you you need new people all the time or you get stagnant and die. And. I think part of why diversity is important in something like homebrewing or in a non any nonprofit volunteer organization is that a you have a bigger pool of people to draw from who are new and excited, and yeah. it, it keeps things more vital for longer. I mean, I've I've been in organizations of different types that are not homebrewing related at all, and yeah, you get you get the same people just showing up all the time. You might get one or two new people, and they show up and leave. That's just ossification. The organization gets brittle and it dies because you don't have that energy of new, excited people coming in. And you need to, to get those people. You need to broaden those horizons and make sure you have the biggest pool of excited people you can bring in. Yeah. Well, and, and it's like, sorry. Go ahead, Melissa. Well, I was going to say one of the initiatives that we want to do with the, the Craft Fermentation Alliance is to get more people, get more women and non-binary involved with judging and involved with entering beers into competitions. And we're going to figure out how to do that. And so we're, we're going to work on that. Michelle can say a little bit more about that. So, yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a beer judge. Um, I'm a Cicerone, you know, I, I enter beers into she brew and queen of beer, um, mostly just those two, because I'm like, eh, I don't really need to go on the competition route, but I want to support those female, um you know led places uh competitions um but you know as soon as nhc medals came out i quickly scanned and i'm like looking for a woman's name and there was none to be had and i was like why why is that i know women are making really great beer they can absolutely compete at this level why are we not doing it and i thought to myself why am i not doing it like i'm not doing that yeah. So I started to look internally about like, what is it that is stopping me? And I started talking to female brewers that I know. And, you know, it's it's something that you find in many different realms of society. I mean, one of the main drivers of the gender pay gap mm-hmm. is that women look at a advertisement for a job. And if they're not, if they don't click 100% of the qualifications, they don't even apply. God, I do that. Men have been found me, me to be, too. they will, they will qualify at 60 to 70% and they'll say, Oh, I'll throw my hat in the ring. Oh God. I, can't. Um, <laughs> I couldn't imagine being that confident. I couldn't do it. There's no way. Yeah. And it comes J- down JP, to that confidence you level, might be women. you know, yeah, we might be, I'm all right with it. Yeah. It, so is, is that um, what so, you found when you said you, you looked within yourself, what is that? Was that what you brought up where you're like, I just, some of it was, you know, I don't have a competent, I don't have a competitive nature to myself. Like mm-hmm. I don't need the validity of other people telling me I make good beer yeah. to participate. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I don't make really flawed beers a lot. So I'm not looking for that, you know, direct feedback as much. Yeah. You know, um, you know, beer. I know well what I'm doing pretty yeah, well. Yeah. 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 Um, and then also the, you know, the expense of it, the hassle of shipping and just kind of all of these roadblocks. But I thought, you know, we need to go that extra mile and be part of, sorry, my dog's barking at the moment. That's right. (laughs) We need to go that extra mile and show that and be visible. You know, like you said, visibility matters. And I want to see those names on the top of those lists and every competition. 
Um, so I know that I myself am going to put aside my own, well, I'm not really that competitive, but you know what? Mm-hmm. I'm not, but I'm also really, really dedicated to seeing women get visibility in this hobby. So I'm going to put myself out there and show others that, yeah, we can do this. And I want to bring other people with me. So through the yeah. WCFA, we want to fundraise so we can help people financially. We can provide them money to enter competitions. Mm-hmm. We can provide them money oh, wow. to ship in their entries. I want to have some, you know, like group Zooms with people who are gold medal winners and we can talk about how they approach competitions. I am a member of a Portland Brewers Collective. It's a little homebrew club here. It's like 15 people, 20 people. We just had the home brewer of the year for the state of Oregon come out of our club. And I talked to him about it and he said, I play the numbers. That's what I do. I enter 15 beers and guess what? I walk away with four medals. That's what Jamel and, used to you know, do all the time. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And that's a tactic, 30, you know? Yeah, mm-hmm. For sure. And a tactic is like, look at the different kinds of, like, are you going to enter the IPA and think you're going to get a medal? Or are you going to mm-hmm. enter the historical beer competition and you're going to have a much better chance of meddling? Yeah. You know, like use some strategy, like of what it is you're hoping to achieve. And I want to instill people in the, you know, just give them the tools, the education, the knowledge to get out there and do this and be seen and, Take so on the big boys. You're a home brewer activist. Sounds Let's like. do it. I am. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely yeah. am. That's cool. I mean, to have such passion for, for, for that, for home brewing, but then also to see other people succeed and elevate other people around you, mm-hmm. even people you don't know. Right. That's, that's, nice. that's, that's the whole point of the Wim's Craft Fermentation Alliance, you know, and it's, I like it. we want to encourage folks who are beer brewers who make, kombucha who do hot sauce fermentations like whatever right we want to have a space for all those folks you know just to come together and a lot of the women in our club too that the the two women few women that are in it are are some of the most creative mead makers and brewers Mm -hmm. and they come in with the most interesting things sometimes where it's like wow i never would have thought to do that but um you know there's a level of creativity that comes to it and also some of the the best palettes that I know are women for sure. I mean, Nicole Ernie, right. and, you know, right. I mean, oh, right. Nicole Ernie, uh, master, about it. master She's sister. A mutant. There's no way that and... a, norm, a normal <laughs> regular human being can have a palette like Nicole yeah. and a vocabulary to match it. There's no know, way. Right? <laughs> and you know, that's a good segue. If I don't, if you don't mind, Brian, right. yeah. uh, please, we just, please. we just released episode 11 of the craft fermentation podcast. You can find it on WCFA.beer, but then it's also on all your normal uh, podcatchers, but episode 11 was the 2022 How to Assess Beer with a Master Cicerone with mm. Nicole Ernie. Right. And oh. she's amazing. She's and great. she herself talked about having imposter syndrome, how men in the industry can make her doubt her own confidence and whether her perceptive abilities are accurate or not. And when you hear someone like Nicole Ernie and Master Cicerone that she questions herself yeah. because of the way men treat her in the industry, that really shows you like, Right. We are not alone in this. It is real and it needs to change. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Exactly. And, you know, Nicole has mentioned that before over the years and, you know, it, it, it is sort of shocking or sort of surprising, I guess, maybe would be a, a, a more general word for that. It's eye opening too. And, yeah. you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot that can be learned still, you know, we, we like to think. Oh, that, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, you know, um, people throw woke around as, as a, as a, as a bad term, but as you know, a good term too, but it's more than that. It's, it's just being aware of everybody. Mm-hmm. I think. Absolutely. A lot you of know? it is internalized in women. I mean, we are socialized to be deferential and yes, to right. step back and not be the one making noise, being loud, being seen, being challenging. Um, so a lot of that we internalize and it's not even the men in our, sphere that are doing that we're doing it to ourselves or other women are doing it to us Mm -hmm. it's not just a man problem by any stretch of the imagination it's a societal problem well i accept your apology i think that's (laughs) i'm I'm joking i'm totally joking because yeah it's i mean white men can take about two percent less blame let's just you know (laughs) there you go (laughs) we need all this percent we need i guess i don't know um yeah, it's, uh, you know, a lot of journeys start with introspection, for sure. And, you know, if you don't know where, what angle you're coming from, mm-hmm. you're not going to get the result that you want, you know. And funny enough, I was talking to my therapist about this today. Where is your trauma? If you react to someone a certain way, 
you're reliving your trauma on that person and you need to figure out your bullshit first. I'm not saying that, you know, women have bullshit to figure out, but you know what I mean? It sort of goes along yeah. with what you're saying. Like we all have, we all have things to figure out. And unfortunately, uh, women and non-binary people have, uh, gotten the brunt of that for a long time. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad to see that uh, things are changing and you guys are really reaching out and really trying to help people. How can listeners get involved uh, with, uh, with your program and, and trying to elevate this hobby that we love so much? Well, you can go to the website, wcfa.beer. Uh, you could definitely nice. come to the summit when sometime. Our next one's going to be in October. So we, we gave ourselves okay. a little break this time so that we could step back and we really want to try to come up with the live sessions around the world. And so we're working on that. And so we're taking a, a little bit of time to really figure out exactly what we wanna happen next and, and to get a, a real international feel to it. And wanna add a lot more speakers internationally. Mm. Um, yeah, follow the podcast, the podcast right? Craft Fermentation yeah. Podcast, head over to the Women's Craft Fermentation Alliance YouTube page. We have all of our 2021 sessions up there. Yep. Um, we're slowly rolling out 2022. Um, pretty much as Incredible. I edit them and put them up as as a podcast, I push them out to Isn't YouTube as worst? well. I hate editing podcasts. Oh, man. it sucks, Jason. I've just <laughs> especially when yeah. like, I I I like it for other people. Like I edit Bruce Strong, and I'm not on that show, so I'm fine with it. But like I edit this, and I edit my other shows, and it's like I just wow, it's hearing my voice. Uh, I lived, I like, I lived, I experienced this show already. The last thing I want to do is do it again. <laughs> but slower and do work during it. And then I have time to think back and go, why did I say that? I'm a fucking dipshit. I shouldn't have said that thing. That came off weird. Whatever. Oh Come my God. Do you, le so do you leave it in or do you edit it out? No, I leave it in because that's me. Like it's, it, I'm an open book. And if I say something stupid, I, I, I own it and I admit it and, you know, never learn from it. Yeah. <laughs> I just get tired of editing out all the, um, yeah. So, uh, yes. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's yeah. about three hours of cutting all that stuff out you of these, never know these one hour how... whip sessions. Yeah. So, um, you never uh, know how much you say, um, until you listen to your recorded voice or read a transcript of something you, when you do a deposition in court, it's like, um, uh, yeah, well, I, uh, like, but yeah, I, I was going to ask if there's one, like, uh, uh, you got a bunch of stuff on YouTube. One thing that we could search out that would be kind of eye opening or interesting as a kind of a, you know, just a, a you know, introduction to, to what you do. What would we search for to find? Well, I would say if you go over to the WCFA YouTube page, we had a uh, women's making, no making noise panel in 2022. Wow. Um, because, you know, in 2021, our, our first, uh, Wibs was in April of 2021, about three weeks before the Brianna Allen rat magnet explosion happened. Mm. Um, and so in 2022, that was something that we definitely wanted to embrace, but we also didn't want it to completely take over the summit. We still wanted plenty of people coming on and sharing how do you distill, how do you use honey and beer, you know, what it's like to open a craft brewery in Uganda. Um but also to kind of focus in on some of these problems and some of these issues. And so, yeah, making noise for a discrimination free industry is great. It's like the brave noise folks, Brian Allen, Ren yeah. Navarro, uh, a couple of other really awesome folks. And they're all talking about just kind of, you know, the What's next and bomb that happened mm. and how they're feeling about it. So cool. that would be one, if you really want to get your feet wet in how women are feeling right now in the industry, that's a fantastic one to, to dive into. Nice. I'll look that up. Yeah. Very cool. I also like on the website, you have a, a whole list of women owned uh, homebrew shops Yep. and breweries. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Support that too. I saw a few people recognize a few names there. I love it. It's, I mean, it's great. It's, it's a, it's a cool thing. It's a long time coming. And, uh, you know, we really need to to embrace everybody in this industry. Thank you. No matter what. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Really appreciate it. And I hope you like the Goza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God is that? Please said more. Uh, <laughs> get out of here, Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> you guys all just lost two judging points at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah Gordon Strong is going to send us a sturdily worded email. <laughs> sure, sure he would. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. I think we're going to take a quick break. Cooper, do you want to do those, that last like pairing or, or should we get out of here? What are we doing? Oh, no. Yeah, I think we 
Too I'd late. love to talk more about this, but yeah, it's, yeah we're, for sure. we're probably running out of time. Okay, we're we running can... out of time. So if you want to have your beer on Dr. Homebrew, you send Brian an email at brian at thebrewingnetwork.com. Make sure to tell him it's a Goza. And, <laughs> um, yeah, and we'll, we'll get you on the schedule. Give me a style name and a category. Yeah, <laughs> at least. You go. Yeah, the next four shows, we're going to have nothing but a Goza and a Goza, then a Goza and a Goza <laughs> again, but yeah. it'll be like IPA and an alt beer. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I think that'd be fantastic. <laughs> Melissa, yeah. Michelle, thank you again very much. You guys can go to wcfa.beer and learn all about the Women's Craft Fermentation Alliance, and I suggest you do it. All right, everyone, thanks a lot for tuning in, and until next time, we'll see you later.